say I'm yours forever My heart is yours today I know I've cost you More than I can pay What can I offer, Lord? I'm willing to obey And I'll do anything for you Whatever you want me to Laying down my own desire Willing to do what you require Anything for you Because I trust in you I'll do anything Anything for you Here's I want you Here's I Here's I Here's I for you
Just worship him in this place. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Lord. Come on, I want some real worshipers in here. Just to join me for just a moment. Come on, I want the real worshipers to worship him just for a moment. Worship him for the generations to come. That those yet unborn may praise him. Worship him for your children. Yes, 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 come on.
just bless him tonight.
want you to take just a moment in this service tonight and just be able to free yourself from all the struggles. Free yourself so that you can truly worship him tonight. Somebody here tonight may be going through a real difficult time and you need to cast all your cares upon him. Why don't you just lift your hands all over this house tonight and let's cast our cares upon the Lord tonight all together.
cares for you. Yes, he does. Every day of your life, every minute of every hour, God is on the throne and he is doing what he does best, and that's being God. <laughs> so somebody say amen to that. Amen. So we're going we're gonna to get started this evening with uh, with good uh, rounded praise and worship time. That's what we're doing. And I, this has been good for me for the past 25, 30 minutes. I'm, 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 I'm psyched up. I'm psyched up. <laughs> and, and as words of Frank Willett, it, uh, it gets gooder and gooder and gooder and gooder. <laughs> Ain't that right there, Judy? That's what he says. That's what he says. I'm telling you. So uh, if we could be a so kind, Judy, would you pray us in, please? Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Dear Lord in heaven, <clears throat> we come before you this evening and ask that you be with us as we proceed with our class. We are anxiously awaiting your word. Please be with Apostle as he is still in the hospital. He's sounding much better, and we thank you for that. Yes. Thank you for the people that are watching us. Thank you for the people that are in our Zoom meeting. God, you are a blessing to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going we're, we're gonna to dive into this thing this evening. I got some material I need to cover. We need to get through the end of 26 tonight. Sis, I've got it up on the screen. Can you see it, or you or do you you gonna read I'm gonna the Bible? I'm going to use my Bible. All right, guys. So we're gonna go from chapter twenty six, verse twelve, all the way through the end of it, please. All the way through the end of twelve. No, the end of twenty six. Okay. I'm yeah, I'm ready. All right, go. <laughs> One day, I was on such a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and commission of the leading priests. About noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven brighter than the sun shone down on me and my companions. We all fell down and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord, I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet. For I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me and tell them what I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles. To open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. And so, King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision from heaven. I preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove they have changed by doing lost my place by the good things they do some jews arrested me in the temple for preaching this and they tried to kill me but god has protected me right up to this present time so i can testify to everyone from the least to the greatest i teach nothing except what the prophets and moses said would happen that the messiah would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead and in this way, announce God's light to Jews and Gentiles alike. Suddenly, Festus shouted, Paul, you are insane. Too much study has made you crazy. But Paul replied, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. What I am saying is the sober truth. And King Agrippa knows about these things. I speak boldly, for I am sure these events are all familiar to him, for they were not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Agrippa interrupted him. Do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? Paul replied, whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am, except for these chains. Then the king, the governor, Bernice, and all the others stood and left. 
As they went out, they talked it over and agreed. This man hasn't done anything to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. Mm, so we, so everybody's having this consultation and trying to figure out what's going on here. I mean, they all came for a show. Let's just let's just say what it is. Where we are right now is, is, is last night we saw where Paul began to, to speak to Agrippa and begin to speak to the audience there. He's he's this is not really a uh a court hearing, if you will. It's basically a fishing expedition on Festus's part to try to find something to uh, write Caesar about because you can't just send Paul to Rome because he appealed to Caesar without formal charges. And so since there's not really anything to, to formally charge him with, so this is a fishing expedition and, and Agrippa just showed up with his sister Bernice, which by the way, they got this fling going on, you know, this, 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 this wrong idea of relationship, but they're in it. And they've showed up with all their court people, with all their, uh, when I say court people, the people in like, you know, um, uh, the, the king's court and the, the important people, the, the city officials, um, uh, where uh, Festus would have four uh, major or guardsmen leaders there who would, who would be in charge of a thousand men each. They would be there. I mean, the, the audience is full of very important and prestigious people, except for the Pharisees. They're the only ones that's not in this, I guess, meeting, if you will. But what this is, is really Fest is bringing Agrippa and Agrippa trying to figure out. And well, you'll find out here in a second. Verse 12 says. One day I was on such a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and commission of the leading priests. This is when he's going to reach back and bring up to par, up to speed, Agrippa, to the reality of where he was. He's already expressed how he was a Pharisee, you know, yet, uh, in the early part of the yesterday's Bible study, and and how you know what he did. He he never compromised. He hadn't done anything wrong. He was, you know, he was part of the of the Pharisees, part of the Sanhedrin. You know, he's part of that clique. And he didn't really do anything. He did everything he was supposed to do. He talked about his early years when he grew up in Tarsus. He, he you know, he, he's laying the foundation to introduce himself to Agrippa because Agrippa has not met this man yet. Agrippa is in charge, in a way of speaking, over the Pharisees. So, in a matter of speaking, this is his former employee. So, this is where he's at. He's there to check things out. Now, Paul had been headed to Damascus, you remember the story, armed with the full authority and the commission of the chief priest. And he likely made mention of the priest again for the benefit of Agrippa to recognize that this individual was one that he appointed. In other words, to remind Agrippa that I used to work for you, remember? Not only that, but Agrippa was also one that was reasonable and was in line with his supervision of he also funded the priesthood of Jerusalem. That's who Agrippa, that's who this king is. He's He is the appointee king that Caesar appoints, being kind of the boss over Jerusalem, the temple, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of that. So his part that he played in this was what Paul was saying louder by what he was not saying. In other words, king, the reason I'm here is because you don't know how to do and be in charge with what you are responsible for. <laughs> in other words, you didn't do your job. So guess what? Here I am, and I'm a, I, I just, I was a secondary uh, consequence. You know, you, you you didn't control your clique. You know that you were in charge of. This, by the way, was the same group that was attacking Paul for what the king should have known before he even walked into that auditorium. He should have knew everything that was going on. After all, he's in charge of the Pharisees, and they were his employees, and Paul was a former employee. The, the event that had moved Paul from his past position as a hunter for the priest to be hunted by the priest had been quite extraordinary, wouldn't you imagine? In fact, Paul put it another way. He, he put it this way in Philippians 3 and verse 12. He says, not as though I had already attained, either were 
already perfected, but I will I press on that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended by Christ Jesus. Paul, what are you saying? He, he's saying, you know, I was seeking after Christ to get him, and he turned around and got me back first. That's what he's saying. So this is this he's laying out the foundation for what you know Agrippa should know because at least the Pharisees was under his thumb, so to speak. Verse 13 and 14 says. About noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone down on me and my companions. We all fell down, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Now, let me, let me, let me, I didn't cover this in, in tonight's lesson as far as the written portion of it. So if you got it, this is extra, if you will. This ain't going to cost you nothing. Hmm. You know, he says, he, first of all, he says that he spoke to him in Aramaic, which, by the way, at this time in our lives here in 2023, that is a dead language. They don't speak ancient Aramaic any longer. That's just, they don't, they don't do that. It, it's not, if there's an Aramaic language, but it's not, it's similar to the ancient Aramaic, but it's not the same. But this is the language that they had in that day and time. In fact, Jesus didn't speak Hebrew. And Jesus didn't speak Greek. Jesus spoke ancient Aramaic. Remember that. And one other extra thing to kind of give you is that notice that when God speaks to we call him Paul, he calls him Saul. Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. He calls him by the name of Saul. Now, I know that somebody has, has taught some in the course of years, and I know it's, it's got a great little theological kind of motif to it. It sounds good. I get it. But that ain't what the scripture says. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that God changed his name. The reason why this is, notice it says he spoke to him in Aramaic. This is their native language and tongue. This is what they was raised up on. This is how he grew up. This is what he spoke. In fact, this is probably what they were speaking at that time in this room. It's not very probable that they are speaking Greek. They wrote Greek, and the Grecian world was leaning upon the entire world. And yeah, Greek would kind of become like the known main language in that time. But remember, the Jews went through a time, now that they speak in Aramaic, at some point in time, they're going to blend over into the Grecian world. But before that, they spoke Hebrew. And before that, Abraham spoke Chaldees. So you can see how the, the adjustment of things are taking place. However, God never changed his name. The word Saul, the name Saul in Aramaic, if you were to say the same name in Greek, you would say it Paul. Actually, you know, it's not pronounced Saul. It's actually pronounced Shoal. Shoal, Shoal. That's how you would say that word. That name, it's not, it's not Saul. We say Saul because we're Americans and that's how we, we read it. That's how we say it. That's how we were groomed and taught in our adolescent years. But in the reality of the of the of the keeping the thing in context and in true scriptural meaning and understanding, God never changed his name. Okay. And I would take the time to talk about the double initiation of deity, but I'm not going to do that right now. Now it is easy to imagine that King Agrippa, in all his pomp, is sitting on the edge of his seat. As Paul told this part of the story, it was more than likely a story that he hadn't quite heard yet. And it was coming from not just from hearsay, it's coming from the man himself. He got front row center. You know, it's like it's like you in Hawaii and getting to sit there and watch Elvis for the first time, right? Same thing, same concept. You're there to see a show. That's what he's there for. The event occurred about, about noon, as Paul said, when he saw this light from heaven. He's talking about that confrontation with Christ. And, and this, this light, this, it was brighter than the sun, blazing all around him. And all those who were traveling with him, too, it's blazing around them. The very presence of this bright light from heaven by the way, it's mentioned in all three accounts 
of every time that he gave this story or every time you find it in scripture, it's the same thing happened. The voice from heaven is also central to all three accounts, by the way. This revealed the, the this revealed word of the risen Christ to the apostle Paul is the centerpiece of the story, is it not? In fact, in ancient Aramaic, Paul had been addressed and asked, why do you persecute me? God said, notice, as he has been the case in every account, Jesus made it clear that Paul had not been persecuting heretics, but rather Christ himself. So when, in essence, when he was grabbing people, when he was killing Stephen, or actually was holding the coast to allow the others to do it, he was they were really trying to kill Christ. One very important addition to this Christ's words here that it's not included in the, either of the other two accounts, that Paul added that Christ had said, it is hard for you to kick against the goals. Now, though this was a Greek proverbial statement, it was also familiar to the Jews and all those who made their living in the agrarian culture. An ox gold was a sharp stick used to prod cattle. It's a cattle prod. It implies that Christ was already trying to goad. By the way, that means to direct. A goad directs or steers the animal, the ox goad, or, you know, we call it the prod, the, the cattle prod, directs, or the word goad means it prick. A good way to remember the first two letters, go, go that way. Do, go, go this way, you know, to direct or steer. Paul in this, in the right direction. He's steering Paul in the right direction. His passion and his convictions were commendable, but he was not heading in the direction that God wanted him to go. He was, <clears throat> excuse me, kicking against the gold. He was, he was kicking against the prick, as some people would say in some translations. Now, this would be a great time that I can use to discuss something about the great communicator. Paul mentioned here for the first time that the Lord had spoken to him on the road to Damascus. Excuse me. <clears throat> and God did that in Aramaic, which, by the way, was his native tongue. The biblical evidence portrays a God who wants to reveal himself and he will to his creature. God can and does speak through every possible means. He does so through burning bushes, handwriting on walls, prophets, visions, dreams, stone tablets, uh, against enemies who shout curses and fling rocks, nature itself, he uses it. He uses donkeys. He uses a still small voice. He, he'll even use an infant born in a stable of animals to get a message across, to communicate. God is always speaking. He's the great communicator. God is always speaking. Question, but are we listening? And is he doing that in a language that we can understand? Is he talking to you in some superficial language or is he talking to you in a language that you can hear? But again, the question is, are we listening? Just verse 15 and 16, please. Who are you, Lord, I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me and tell them what I will show you in the future. Mm, yeah, I love this. Upon Paul's inquiry as to the identity of who that speaker is, that great communicator, the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And that, I, let me pause right there for a minute. How would you feel <laughs> if you've been doing things you thought you were doing was right? And God himself showed up with a big bright light around you, knocked you off your horse or out your car, put you on the ground, and all you can't see nothing but this bright light. And all you hear is his voice. You don't hear the car running. You don't hear nobody else running around you. You don't hear nothing. You don't see it. All you hear is his voice. Okay? And he asks you, he, he says, you know, I am the one that you're, you know, kicking against the goads. I'm the guy that you're persecuting. I'm the dude that you're after, and yet you don't know it yet. How would you feel if God put you at your at your average life and, and made you come to grip with him and his voice? I believe God does it every day. I think the problem is we ain't listening. 
In that moment, in that flash of that brilliant light, brighter than the sun, by the way, it's it's all coming together for Paul. The resurrection, the pricks to his conscience, the goads, the deepening conviction that this movement, which is, by the way, called the way, held the truth for him. The information is to follow is also very unique to this particular recounting of the Damascus Road experience. From his prostrate position, Paul was commissioned by Christ himself. He was to be the servant of Christ. And Christ's witness, the ongoing theme of Acts, predicts in Christ's words in 1.8 what they were going to be doing. What well, we read all of what Luke writes. Paul would tell the world about not only this experience at Damascus, but also about the other times that Christ would come to him. Paul was to be the recipient of a great deal of God's light to both Jews and Gentiles. Verse 17, 18 says, And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. You know, one of the things really neat right there, he, he, I mean, you know, it doesn't record anything or, or, or Paul doesn't say anything about he said anything else or interrupted Christ. Christ just, or God just continued talking. And I love how he says, yes, I am sending you. I mean, it always makes me wonder, was Paul thinking, uh-uh? <laughs> <laughs> and God said, uh-huh, you know. Uh, and, and, and let me also point something out to you that I do. If you'll see that word right there, uh, and I'll make it bold for you so you can so you can see it. Let me change its color so you understand what I'm talking about. This word right there, that word, actually, it's actually pronounced satan, just so you know. And the, the but he says the power of satan to God. The, 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 he's he's going to be freeing the people from this darkness, from this power that satan had, switched them over to God. And there's something I just want to point out to you. There's something that I do. I'm not saying this is something you you got to do. I just want to point out to you how the conviction of the Lord will talk to you in different ways. To me, I can't capitalize his name. If you capitalize, aren't you supposed to in proper grammar? Aren't you supposed to capitalize the, the precise name of an individual? Mm -hmm. Ain't that what it says? Ain't that what we were taught, all of us? That's well, what we uh, yes. Yeah, right. because it's supposed to show respect and honor. Well, guess what? I don't even show him respect or honor in my grammar. And that's why I don't capitalize his name ever in any time I'm <laughs> referencing him. Um, now, imagine this sobering word at the start of his ministry. Jesus said, I will rescue you. Now, inherent in this statement was the promise of danger. I'm going to rescue you. Don't you... You don't need rescuing unless you're in danger. Mm -hmm. so, so he's not only promising him that he's going to be rescued, but he's also promising him he's going to be in some danger. From which Paul would need rescuing from. And in fact, the two sources of the danger would be in his own people, the Jews and the Gentiles, of course, and whose court, by the way, he's standing in. At Paul's conversion, Jesus promised him what kind of trouble that Paul was going to be causing and what he was going to be experiencing not only for himself but for the christians despite the trouble though christ promised rescue we sometimes when i was growing up i remember um as a teenager especially uh and a young child even when i would go to church and i would be I, i'd be forced to sit kind of near the front with, with my, my grandmother and uh or whichever grandmother i was with and i would remember preachers you know everything's going to be just perfect when you just turn your life over to the lord well yes and no your life is going to be perfect you're going to have a perfection of life you you've got eternal life that's been promised to you but life ain't going to be easy because the devil can't stand it and so he's going to bring anything he can against you to cause you to doubt god to back away from god to 
Stop following the Lord. He's going to do what he can to cause you distress and, and heartache and make you want to renounce him altogether to serve the Lord. He wants you to serve himself. The devil wants you to serve him. And so he will come at you with all kinds of things. It's not going to be easy. But what is promised to you, even though the things are going to come against you, is the rescue. So, yes, will you have trouble? Absolutely. Are you going to face problems and trials? You better guarantee it. Are you going to deal with things that's going to going to going to going to try your uh, I used to like to say uh, try your Jesus. Yeah, there are going to be things that are going to try your Jesus. But but along with all of that, this like the scripture says, he provides the, the he doesn't put anything on you that more that you can bear. But with that that he puts on you, he also gives you a way to escape. So we have rescue in our at our at our fingertips. It's just your rescue is always just a praise away. <laughs> I always like to say that. Christ's words of commission, by the way, to Paul, sounds like the word predicted of the Messiah, like in Isaiah 35 and 5, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. And then Isaiah 42, 7, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. You know, Michael, you said something to me earlier today. You said, you know, how you know, you was instructing that person that, you know, look over in them shadows. That's where the evil's in shadows, the evil's in darkness. But mm -hmm. when the light, when the light gets, in, the darkness can't overtake the light. And, mm -hmm. and, and look what Isaiah 61, one says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because the Lord has anointed me. How come? For what reason? To bring good news to the afflicted. Well, why would he do anything like that? He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Really? Yeah. And to proclaim liberty to captives. What else? And freedom to prisoners. See, this is this is God's MO, if you will. And this everything what he's talking about here in his confrontation with Agrippa kind of sounds like all this, doesn't it? Paul was to be God's instrument of turning both Jew and Gentile from the power of Satan to God, inviting them to receive forgiveness of sins, which he did. Now, Paul was also to offer both Jews and Gentiles, a full place among those who are sanctified by faith, which he did. Paul took every opportunity to remind his audience that the Gentiles had an equal share in God's inheritance, which he did. This inheritance is the promise and the blessing of the covenant that God made with Abraham. He's just, he's just doing it anew, doing it with everybody. He's not just picking out just a few chosen. Can, can I introduce you to some a new term? I like to do this. I like to call it a true state. Paul gives us right here a grim reminder of that what it means to be lost. Um, apart from Christ, people, when, when we are not in Christ, people are blinded and in spiritual darkness, are they not? <laughs> they are under the sway of Satan and because of their sins, unforgiven, by the way, or they're under condemnation. And many times we forget those facts. As we progress in our Christianity, as we go further and further, sometimes we get so caught up in our religiosities, we forget some things that are some basic truths. Today, when you look at people who are well-dressed, polished, moral, successful, at least in the world's eyes, do not automatically assume that they have no needs until they put their total trust in Christ. They are in a terrible state. They can have all the wealth and the, and, and, and the youth and the power and the beauty and, and, and they can have all the, they can have it all. If they have everything going on for them, but if they don't have Christ, they're in a terrible state. Let, let, let this way of thinking stir you in, in your compassion in your prayer, and in your action, in your evangelism. When you are delivered from the awful lost state of sin, you are then delivered into what I would like to call a true state of Christ and in Christ. I think we, we sometimes we lose that reality sense as we progress in our religiosities. Verse 19 and 20 says, And so, King Agrippa, 
I obeyed that vision from heaven. I preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem <clears throat> and throughout all Judea, and also to the Gentiles that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove they have changed by the good things they do. Hmm, the women. You, you, you get to prove that you've what? Changed. Changed. Oh. Huh. From that point, Paul had been obedient to the heavenly voice and the heavenly vision. He had begun in Damascus. How shocking it must have been for those people that lived there. Not only just the believing, but the unbelieving Jews. All of them to have seen this difference between the Saul they knew or the Saul that they were told about and the Saul that got there. Paul recorded his progress from Damascus to Jerusalem to Judea and beyond. That's what he just said. Ultimately, his field of endeavor under the sovereign leadership of God was towards the Gentiles, was it not? Though the locations changed and the nationalities changed, the message stayed the same at every stop, every place he went, repent, turn to God, do deeds consistent with repentance all the time, repent, turn to God, do deeds consistent with repentance. Every time he went to the next place, repent, turn to God, do deeds consistent with the repentance. This message, of course, tied Paul, to, by the way, to John the Baptist. We can see that in Matthew 3, also to Jesus in Matthew 4, and to Peter in Acts and 2. They all called for repentance and conversion personally. They all declared that a change of heart and mind is the right change of direction and action. Paul had preached this message, by the way, to both Jews and Gentiles alike. He didn't, he didn't, you know, differentiate. He made, made the, the, the focus to people. He did it in synagogues all over, in the streets and prisons and courtrooms, all throughout the empire. And many had decided to believe and repent. But then and there are what I would like to call the Festus excuses. Festus to me represents the individual who thinks he is too intelligent to listen to Christ. I'm not convinced. You ain't convinced me yet. I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. I, I, I like to do with this over here and do it. I like to think about this over there. I like to, I like to talk about this other, uh, this other kind of religion over here. You know, I, I'm too smart to believe in that junk. No sensible Roman and even modern day person today could believe in a resurrection. <gasps> what, John? Oh, no, I'm serious. I'm serious. Okay. But Festus here is a typical example of so many we have today. They're intelligent. They're logical, practical, even cynical at times. Paul was saying to Festus that this message of Christ had been attested to for now three decades. These events, they happened. Jesus' death and resurrection was proven fact in that day. In other words, Christianity makes perfect sense. It gives real answers to real questions about a real life and a life beyond. If you'll listen, to it, if you read it, if you give it a chance, most who reject Christ have never looked closely at Christ or of his claims. Now, don't be afraid to show the Festuses in your life either. In the world of the risen Savior, there is plenty of convincing evidence for the cynics to see. If someone will just point them to it. If we could just show them the reality of his, instead of, you know, it's, it's kind of like people love to invite folks to church. I don't invite folks to church. Oh, John, you're supposed to invite people to church. No, there ain't no scripture in the Bible that says invite them to church. You can't show it to me. If you show it to me, I'll eat it. By the way, you can send me an email at drjohnroberts at wildmail.com. If you can show me in scripture that, 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 that it says that you've got to go to church I'll eat that fast and I'll, I'll do it on live online and you can see it because I'm I can I'm telling you it ain't there. Hey, it's not there. Yeah. How can you invite somebody to church when you're already in church? Well, how can you invite somebody to church when you already are? That's what I'm saying. Right, exactly. That's what I'm right. And and on top of that, you don't want to invite somebody to church. That, that's not witnessing. 
okay? That's bringing a visitor. If you want to, if you don't invite them to church, you invite them into your life. Let them see the real you behind the scenes. Let them see the you that when you hammer a nail and you hit your thumb instead of that nail head, you say something besides praise the Lord that comes out your mouth, okay? <gasps> oh, did you say that? Yes, I did. That hurt you. Come here, bring me your thumb. I'll match and see what you say, you know, because it's a fact. We are real people with real issues, living in the real world that needs a real savior. And only we can give them the real proof of what he really is. Amen. Verse 21 through 23 says, hmm. Some Jews arrested me in the temple for preaching this, and they tried to kill me. But God has protected me right up to this present time, so I can testify to everyone mm -hmm. from the least to the greatest. I teach nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen. Continue. Okay. That the Messiah would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead. And in this way, announce God's light to Jews and Gentiles alike. Yes. For his simple obedience to this incredible, powerful calling for his faithful presentation of this gospel message. Paul has now got arrested. He was done so in the temple. And now the attempts have even been made against his life. But God has been true to his prominent promises to rescue him. God protected him, leaving him alive to testify to everyone, including those before whom he was standing. Now then, Paul summarized what he had said in front of every Jewish audience so far in his ministry. I teach nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen concerning the suffering Messiah and the promise of his resurrection. This resurrection, which followed the rejection and murder of the Messiah, would serve as a beacon, God's light to the Jews and Gentiles alike. Verse 24 says, Suddenly, Festus shouted, Paul, you are insane. Too much study has made you crazy. <laughs> Festus, Festus couldn't even stand it no more. <laughs> you got to think about it. Festus has already tried him once, you know, like, you know, and, and it's Paul who says, you know, I, I appeal to Caesar, right? So he's already, he's already stood his ground with Festus, with the Pharisees, by the way, who made their case against him. They couldn't make a case. They had all the talk about, you know, what he did wrong, but they had no proof and evidence to, to show against it. So Festus couldn't stand it anymore. And so he inter interrupted Paul. And by the way, the Greek word there is megalatephone. Does that sound kind of something similar? Can you, can you not hear in the original language what it even sounds like? It would read literally in English with a great voice. Phone. Well, the word phone means, or phone is, is means voice. When you're on the phone, it's your voice that's being operated. That's what that's where we get this word. By the way, that's where we get our word phone from. Okay. And megalate is is what's megala? You know, you take a megaphone, megaphone. This is where we get our English word megaphone from. Okay. The message of the suffering Messiah was one thing, but to actually believe that he had been killed by his own people and then had been raised from the dead as a light to the world was just too much for this man's humanistic mind, this Roman governor. He can't do it. He then decides that Paul must be insane and that Paul had suffered himself into his insanity as he did it to himself through all them studies. And they're witnessing it right here. All this talk about Moses and the Messiah, repentance and forgiveness, it was just confusing to Festus. Festus, he ain't no Jew. He don't. He knows about them. All he knows about Jews is they're hard people to deal with. And so he was so compelled. He just couldn't take it no more. This has gone too far. You, I, I not only have you lost me in the conversation, I'm, I'm swimming out here in the matrix, but I don't know what you'd be talking about. And, and can somebody give me the cheat sheet to understand what he's saying? Because I don't get it. Where's the cliff notes for this? Because I don't. I ain't got it. Festus couldn't handle it because he was, because Paul was talking 
in realms of divinity realms. He was speaking of realms in the spirit. He was speaking realms of truth that God had. I mean, let's, th let's face it. Paul is a Pharisee of Pharisee. He knows the law. He studied under Gamaliel, the, the, the head biggest teacher in, of all Jewish rabbis, Gamaliel. He was the head dog in charge. And this guy, th th he studied under him. He had this great epitaph of everything that God had given him, given him throughout his young years and up into his Pharisaic days. And he just, he had it all together. And when he met God, God just put, put all the pieces together and connected all the dots and straightened them out. And now he's speaking in terminologies and vocabularies and grammatical spiritual terms that are just absolutely beyond a lost person's mind. Hence the scripture that says, don't cast your pearls before swine because yeah. they don't understand it. So you can't talk about things like, you know, you, you hear it all the time. You hear it in churches all the time. You know, we're going to talk about the 666, you know, stuff. And then all these lost people show up to talk about 666. And all, the only thing you could do is scare the hell out of them. That's it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't continue scaring that hell out of them, the hell's going to continue staying right there with them. And 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 this is where we we shouldn't be. I, I think it's a bad idea to take new believers and just jump them in revelation. I think it's a bad idea because they don't have a foundation yet. You've got to build a foundation. Wherever they are, you got to build that foundation. There's ways to do it, but I don't think scaring them is one of them. Verse 25 through 27 says. But Paul replied, I am not insane. Most excellent Festus. I ain't what crazy. A... I ain't crazy. I'm not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you most excellent Festus, you who are above all everything. Hey, you know, I ain't crazy. <laughs> Go ahead. And King Agrippa knows about these things. I speak boldly, for I'm sure these events are all familiar to him. Mm. For they were not done in a corner. Mm. King Agrippa, do you believe? <clears throat> do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Okay, so let's 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 see how smart Paul has been trained by the Pharisees. Ready? This is going to come out of him. I mean, Grandma said if it's in you, it'll come out. Well, here it is. It's going to pour right out of him. Paul affirms to the governor that he was not only not out of his mind but he was instead speaking the sober truth and that he had the most important of implications for all those within his, his hearing of what he's speaking. Paul turned to Agrippa for confirmation of what he had just presented, stating his certainty that none of these things had escaped his notice. Agrippa's responsibilities, by the way, was for the temple activities in Jerusalem, they were surely have caused him to cross paths with the activities of the church or those who were in the way. He would likely, more than likely, have been familiar with not only those Old Testament scriptures, but also the basics of Jesus' life and the start of the church in Jerusalem. By the way, it's in Jerusalem where the temple is. And in the wake of Jesus' crucifixion and even the claimed resurrections that multiplicity of witnesses had come forward to say they seen him. They told everybody that they could say, they, I saw him, he's alive. What about those two cats walking on the road to Emmaus? What about, what about, what about the, the women that went there and showed up? And what about all the disciples? How many people were standing there when he rose and ascended on high? I mean, hundreds of people are there. And and out of all those people, only 120 show up in Jerusalem. Now, whether they all didn't, for whatever reason, didn't get to Jerusalem, I don't know. I think it's a God-instructed thing that led them to whatever, but they were still disciples of the Lord. No one, and to assume that, well, they just didn't walk the full journey, so they just, you know, they, they, just, they just didn't make it. How do you know? How do you know? You don't know. You can't assume that. That's, you can't make that judgment call. That's on God. That's between them and God. Just like everybody wants to preach Judas in, in hell. It just, it's just, it's crazy. That's, well, anyway, 
Have you ever heard of the term reasonable faith? It's okay if you haven't. I hadn't either until not too long ago. Paul right here was appealing to the facts. Everybody say facts. 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 And the people were still alive who had heard Jesus and seen his miracles performed. They were still alive. They could at that time prove the empty tomb at that moment. In fact, by this time, the Christian message had already really begun to turn the world at that time upside down. The history of Jesus' life and the early church are facts. They all knew it. And they, they, and there are even facts to this very day. And, 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 and in time, they've been open for us to examine them. We still have eyewitness accounts of the life of Christ recorded, not only in the Bible, but in several historical accounts as well, all the way back to those first early days, hence Josephus, Eusebius. I mean, there's a list of them that's there. We can look to the archaeological records and the accounts there when they've made their digs about all of these things that testify the validity of all of them. And to say that none of that is true, it's like you've stuck your head in the sand. Examine the events and the facts as verifiable, I dare you. And this will strengthen your witness and your faith on top of that. And this is what I call reasonable faith. Now, Paul's statement that, that he's, he's, his was not done on a corner is, is simply an idiomatic way of reminding his audience that Christianity had been very public in its movement from the moment of its inception being the church. From the first day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people had been converted in the temple courts, mind you, of all places in Jerusalem, and all of that done in just one day. And he's reminding Agrippa of all of that. And Agrippa knows it. Next, Paul got very personal, and even very direct with Agrippa, asking and then answering his own question when he's confronting Agrippa and the knowledge that Agrippa had, the beliefs of the prophets. Now, this is what he's talking about. Agrippa could provide, if he were so inclined, maybe, plenty of information to Festus on the subject of Judaism. Could he not? The Messiah, and even Jesus, and not to mention about those who are in the way, it wouldn't take much for that man. He, You know he knows. Mm -hmm. He could corroborate what Paul was saying so far and confirmed that his message was not far removed from the mainstream Judaist theology. But Grippa didn't, okay? What's 28, sis? Agrippa interrupted him. Do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? Mm, Paul's direct question probably embarrassed Agrippa, more than likely. It got his dandruff up, so to speak. I mean, this was stated in front of all of his court officials, all those powerful crowd people that were there, all the people in that auditorium. Well, where is Paul's manners? I mean, notice the tone here, how Agrippa's response in what appears to be a condescending fashion. It, 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 what, he, he's basically shooting back. What we really are seeing is Paul just took a shot across the bow of Agrippa's world, which makes it not really clear that Agrippa's tone of voice was harsh or maybe joking. Whatever the case may be, the desired effect did, after all, happen to take place. If Agrippa were to say that he did not believe the prophets, then he would have lost the influence of his Jewish constituency. If he were to say that he did believe the prophets, then he would have played right into the hands of Paul, the evangelist, and right there he would or could have to say, you know, that there's no reason not to believe in Christ. See, this man's in a perplexed situation, isn't he? Agrippa just retaliated, and he did it real quick, too. He reminded the apostle who was the prisoner here and who was the potentate. Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? In the Greek, that phrase means in a little while or briefly. The King James renders that Greek phrase, which is in the original language, in oliga, as almost. The, the, it uses, the, it changes that word in the scripture 
the King James does to the word almost, but that's not correct in this translation. That's not a correct thing to say. You can't translate it to almost. The question then may have been a jab at Paul and his message saying that he would not be easily persuaded as Paul's other converts had been. In other words, I am better than your converts. It's not almost. It's like, in a little while, you think you got enough time to turn me over? Really? You know, that's what he's saying in a condescending tone. Now, we can talk about what resisting the truth means. Truly, really, think about it. Agrippa heard the gospel from Paul, didn't he? But it seems to have been considered to a degree, but then idealized as entertainment. Like so many before and after him have done. Agrippa stopped within hearing distance of the kingdom of God. He was just in an earshot of being set free. But something happened, didn't it? He left himself without an excuse. He heard the gospel, didn't he? But he decided it wasn't worth responding to personally. Unfortunately, his mistake isn't uncommon. In fact, many who read the story of Christ also don't believe. Do you know any? Do you know mm -hmm. any people who are unsaved? Mm -hmm. Well, what's the problem? Is it not really that the gospel is really convincing enough for them? Or that they don't really need to know God personally? What is it? Is it that they chose not to respond? What has been your response to the gospel? Let's Turn this around and look at it from your own perspective. When you listened to it before the point that you heard it, to do you recall how you felt? What was going on in your mind? Can you can you look back in your old self and see just how you unsaved you once were? Can you see your response to the message of Christ before you were saved? You recall what you used to do, how you, how you used to respond to it. Now that you are on this side of eternity, what has it done to turn your life around? How do you explain the now new feeling of hope that you've got of eternal life? Hey, be honest about it. Has it been a message to resist or to reject? It may seem like too great a price to give God full control of your life, but it is an even greater price by far to live eternally apart from him either because mm. you have chosen not to be his child. These are serious questions that we should be asking ourselves, especially when we're looking into the mirror to look and we want to look at somebody else and point their bad out when we don't want to look to ourselves. Verse 29 says, Paul replied, whether quickly or not, I prayed to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am, except for these chains. The passion of this apostle and the universal need of the gospel message comes through in Paul's response right here. It's such a brisk and brilliant statement. Notice how Paul changed the tone when he exchanged. This was not Paul the debater. This is Paul the evangelist with a tender heart for the lost souls in need of finding the Savior. Paul explained that it didn't matter to him whether it took Agrippa a short time or a long time. He didn't care, but that he would be praying that Agrippa and everyone else in that room that was listening would become just like he was. Except, of course, for those chains that, and he excluded them. Paul wanted them to find the Messiah as he had discovered him. He wanted them to know that this Savior was needed by everyone, from the lowest to the highest, and everyone in between. In other words, Paul was saying, take it from me, the one who used to hunt down the Christians, all in the name of religion. There isn't a soul that is too far away to be found by the Savior. Excuses, excuses. That's all we've heard in this conversation, mm -hmm. excuses. I, I, I got to borrow your terminology, Michael. I got because I, I couldn't I couldn't escape what you said in, in your message the other day, and I had to bring it into focus here. 
excuses, excuses. The Felix excuse is this. I'm too involved in other things and pursuits to listen to Christ. Mm. And it's just not convenient for me right now. Um, when I get my life together, I'll go to church. The Festus excuse is I'm too intelligent to listen to Christ. I'm just not convinced yet. You haven't convinced me yet. I don't see anything, any truth in it. I, I just don't understand it, what you're doing. And the Agrippa excuse, I am too important to listen to Christ. It doesn't concern me. I'm above all of that. Listen, pride comes in so many different forms. It, it dooms the brightest of angels, Lucifer. It doomed him. He was the most brilliant of all. He was the son of the morning. And yet, look what happened to him. Mm -hmm. and it, will, it will kill anyone. Pride will kill anyone who thinks himself above needing a savior. Do you honestly think that you are too important for him? Are you too powerful? When you have done any of these things in your responses to the gospel message, then you have overestimated yourself. The underestimate you need. You have underestimated what you need. You have underestimated God. What excuses do you use to avoid Christ or what he has let you to know you need to stop or what he wants you to do? How many excuses can you come up with? Are you avoiding his word? When it is too hard, do you throw your hands up and say, well, maybe I'm just not supposed to get it? <laughs> well, again, you have underestimated the spirit of God that is, by the way, in you to lead you and guide you into all truth. That's what the scripture says. And not some truth, but all truth. You can't say, well, God does not want me to learn that. That's not true. He says the Spirit of God is in you to lead you and guide you into all truth. The destiny of these three powerful rulers shows us, it should warn us against the pride and the indifference and the carnality and even our souls, what that can do, our minds, our feelings, our emotions, and could be used against Christ. We must know the reality of excuses. I love your message. I guess you could tell. I put it in. Put it in tonight. Mm -hmm. Verse thirty and thirty-one says. Then the king, the governor, Bernice, and all the others stood and left. As they went out, they talked it over and agreed. This man hasn't done anything to deserve death or imprisonment. Agrippa may have been getting uncomfortable with the way that the conversation had turned. By the way, maybe. Maybe he was moving toward conviction. We don't know. Perhaps he had simply heard all he needed to hear. No more. Can't do no more. Or maybe to know what he thought of it all. We don't know. In any case, Agrippa decided that the meeting this is it. I'm done here. I'm out of here. I got. I got to go to the. I got to go down to the Denny's. I got to get me something to eat. You know, I've had enough of this. Festus, ain't that what we do? You first, I mean, you know, you'd be sitting in church, they'd be making an altar call, people up there praying, getting right with the Lord. And the only thing you can think about is Denny's. Am I going to have enough time to get there and give me some hot wings? I mean, mm -hmm. come on. You know, mm -hmm. Festus, Festus oh. and Agrippa, that's the truth, right? Mike, well, come on, man. Walk I mean, it up and walk out. Oh, well, yeah. Festus and Agrippa discussed the case and agreed that Paul was innocent. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. He's innocent. King Agrippa, a Jewish sympathizer, and he's also well-versed in Jewish issues, added his legal vindication of the Christian movement. This would be of great comfort and usefulness, by the way, to the believers around the empire who were experiencing increasingly dangerous, intense pressures from those who wanted to prosecute them, prosecute the Christian movement, who being anti-Jewish and even anti-Roman. They wanted to put a stop to it, but that was driven by the demonic forces itself. This is this is all we're seeing as a spiritual war. Verse 32 says, And Agrippa said to Festus, he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. Couldn't he just say, well, I don't, I'll take my appellate back. Couldn't he say something? There should have been some kind of legal terminology there that he could have used. No, they, they, I look, th now, why would he not do that? Why would he not say, hey, I can take the Let's, let's have it right now. You know, I, I, re, I revoke my, my, th towards Caesar, my, my, my appellate towards Caesar. I mean, couldn't he say something? Paul didn't say anything. 
Paul's appeal to Caesar, of course, had pretty much taken the matter out of their, their respective jurisdictions, so to speak. This isn't a hearing. This is a fishing expedition. Paul had to go to Rome. God told him he was going to get there. Why didn't Paul speak up? Because in Paul's mind, this is the way God wants him to go to get there. He could have been set free. But Paul was instead free from the murderous Jews and the setting out on an all-expense-paid first-class voyage. And by the way, pray trip all the way from Rome or to Rome by Caesar himself. He ain't got to flip the bill for nothing. His plane ticket is took care of. His, his cruise ship travel has all been took care of. But this is where we will find Paul next week. What you think about that? Awesome. All right. Michael Whitlow, you go first. I don't know if I want to go on this one. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot going on here. Yes, sir. You know, I, I love um, how you explain it down to um, the T and, and to um, explain about the language. Because Aramaic isn't here anymore. It was there. Mm -hmm. And I put the names Jesus, Saul. There was other people who, who spoke it, but we don't know it because it's not nowhere around that we can find it anymore, except for the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, that bright light, wow. Paul wasn't the, or Saul wasn't the only one to see that bright light. There was other people who saw the bright light. It was bright. Um, um, that's what I have written down. Now, when we deal with with um, uh, the, the um, uh, so it is, we say in the Bible, in King James Version, they bring it out, they put that little line over it and say Satan. You said Satan. 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 Yes. And 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 that's interesting to know that you know most most preachers and most people who have been anointed only know Satan. Mm -hmm. They don't say such a time. Mm -hmm. And this this is really this touches me. And I said, isn't it ironic that God's going to bless you? And Satan is there. Mm -hmm. But the Lord is there also. It's interesting to see two people in the room, two spirits in the room, that's getting ready to battle. Mm -hmm. Because the Lord isn't going to battle. The Lord just going to tell them to leave. But, but uh, Satan, Satan, He's just mm -hmm. he's, he's just going crazy. Where do we find Jesus now? Yeah. Yeah. True. That's what I'm off at. Where do we find Jesus now? Because mm -hmm. we didn't spoke of him. He's all out there now. But where do we find him now? Yeah, that's good. You know, the thing that you're, when you make mention of that, you know, like, if you were to Google, and I just did it right now while you were talking, right, fast, mm -hmm. to see what would pop up. As soon as I type in the word Satan and meaning behind it, you know what the mm -hmm. first thing that popped up? Is that? Lucifer, the devil. Yes, Lucifer, yeah. That's how it pops up with the definition of it. But that's not the definition of the word. The definition of the word, Satan, or the name Satan, is to be an adversary. Mm -hmm. He's adverse to something. Yes. And he's he's adverse to the will of God, adverse to you know the kingdom of God, adverse to the children of God. He's adverse to anything godly, whatever that may be. Doesn't matter what it is. If it's God's name on it, he's adverse to it. Okay. He's against it. This is where you know people start either you know they start depending on their traditions and things that they've been taught over the course of years and 
and they just go by those, you know, uh, th those those things that grandma and grandpa told them, and they just continue and continue and continue because they're comfortable and they just want to stay right there. They don't yeah. want to go. They don't want to. They don't want to, you know, tread the waters, so to speak, or 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 or, or trudge new ground that's never been rolled. I mean, there are some people want the easy way. You know, it's unfortunate, but it's true. And um, when you come to certain things, you know, there are people who are frightened of certain things. When you like say the word, you, know, you should, I had, I actually pronounced it correctly to a, a church person at a church one time, not too long back, it's pronounced his name. And I actually had an elder of the church direct, in the church service when I said it, when the person asked me the question, said, that's heresy. You can't say it like that. I can't say what like what. You can't say his name like that. Who? Satan. You got to say Satan. Really? He knows who I'm talking to. Mm -hmm. that, that's not his name. How you said it? His name is Satan. No, that's how you said it. They didn't know how it's actually pronounced. Well, how do you know? Maybe I don't know. I, you know, I, I and I have to choose my battles and learn not to argue with people who are just argumentative. Because mm -hmm. whether they know it or not, they have entered into a realm of Satan. They have become adverse in trying to protect his name. And the system, the Word, the Microsoft Word, and other programs, when they get to the name S-A-T-A-N, they want to, you know, make the first letter, you know, you know, you know make it bigger to give him honor and respect because it's a, it's a personal name. No, it's not a personal name. His, his name means adversary. His personal name was Lucifer. But he's no longer Lucifer. He's no longer the son of the morning. He's, he's, he's everything that's dark. He's everything that's evil. He's everything that's conspiracy. He's everything that's adversary. And, and that's where people, you know, I hate to say it, in some ways they become ignorant of those things, not recognizing the reality of what is true. But the English, the English version gives him that power. That, that right, exactly right. Because that's the way it's at it, that is a noun. Yeah, that's true. Say person, person, place, or thing. Correct. Already, always. Yeah. Capital in the front. Correct. That's right. That's just that's how we've been taught. But but that's you know, um, you know, you can't. Let me ask you a question. If I was to walk up to you and say, well, the adversary said this, do I capitalize the A? No. Well, that's what his name means, which is pronounced Satan. In fact, when you look at it, when G Jesus was tempted, the word in the original language, it's actually in several of the translations of the Bible, it says Satana. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, which again means adversary. It means somebody he was against, you know, that's who they are. But, you know, that's okay. We're, you know, we're, we, if we remain teachable, this won't upset us. This won't make you mad. You'll be grateful that somebody set you free from something you've always been taught that may necessarily not be correct. But, hey, what do I know? I'm just a fat hillbilly saved by grace. What else you got there, brother? Well, that's about it. That's, that's, that's okay. it. I mean, I mean that's <laughs> that. Where, where do we find Jesus now? Yeah, man, that's true. That's, that's true. You know, so, uh, uh, I, I, you know, this was interesting. This is interesting because I hear preachers preach this in church, but they don't go in depth. Mm -hmm. They will not go in depth. But they walk in there sometimes and they say, we're going to spend the next three weeks on, on this. But we'll spend the next three weeks on this. Because it could be over with. I mean, you 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 at the end of it anyway. True. Three, you can knock it out. Yep, yeah, you could. But we don't do that. We don't do that at all. Yeah. We just do what we want to do, and not what God have us to do. <laughs> hey, Amen. Good word, brother. Sis Judy, thank you, Mayor Michael. Judy, mm -hmm. what you got to say about this girl? Well, I agree with Michael. There's a lot going on here. Mm -hmm. Um, I. You gave some good points for me personally. Um, and I always enjoy it when you give us 
the actual meaning of words and how they came about and what they really mean. Mm -hmm. That always makes it easier. Um, and you talked about um, how did we feel before we were saved when we were approached with the word. And you refused it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my feeling was um, that I wasn't good enough to be saved. Wow. How about that? Yeah. So, so I, I lived for many, many, many years and God was always there in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and in times when I had no control um, and he took care of things for me, uh, mm -hmm. amazing. And, and now I do have that feeling of hope for eternal life because used to, I would think, well, when I die, I'm going to hell, you know, mm -hmm. no matter what I do, I can't fix this. Mm -hmm. And through study and, and listening to you guys and talking to apostle, um, I don't have those feelings anymore. Mm. And then you talked about pride um, and anyone who denies God. And, and a lot of times it could be pride because they do think they're too good to depend on a God. Um, and I, I always truly felt that he didn't have any need for me. I was just an afterthought. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm learning. I'm, and learning. I'm grateful. Um, and I do remain teachable. And I, I love what you said about Satan and the meaning. Um, because adversary, that's exactly what he is. Mm -hmm. exactly. He's against everything that we love and hold dear. Amen. You're right. Unfortunately. Uh, that's we got about all I got. Well, good. Well, hey, um, did you learn something? Did y'all get it? I absolutely did. Oh, a lot. I learned a lot. Yeah, that's a that's a, that's some that's some good stuff right there, you know. Um in in, in, in coming to in coming to terms with uh those things that uh um, that we learn in 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 studying, you know, a lot of people think that studying the Bible or having Bible study, you know, you got to get through so much so quickly. Unless you you can lose a lot by doing those things. That's, in fact, that can be dangerous grounds. To be quite honest but, with you, but John, here's people that come and they talk about the Bible. Yes, and the Bible is an organism. Yes. An organism starts with one cell and probably gets many cells. Mm -hmm. It grows. But one thing I do know is that when you be around an organism and it changes, why aren't you changing? Mm, that's good. That's a good word, brother. That's a very good word. Because here... This organism goes from one thing to another, but you still at the one thing. You haven't even got to the another yet. Right, yeah. And then you want to talk about it and argue about it, but you don't even know what the another means. Yeah. It, it, it always got the best of me when I'll be in church service and I'll be sitting there and somebody say, yeah, I'll just pray my, my soul, my, my strength in the Lord. You know, uh, it's like every week they're going to, you know, their, their strength of the Lord is going to fade. Well, where is the strength of the Lord? You, I mean, you have to pray for it all the time or does God give it to you? You know, um, yeah, I, I just need you to pray for my, you know, the devil's really been attacking me. Ever since I turned my life over to the Lord, the devil been the devil always been attacking you. He attacked you when you was in the world. He attacked you when you was not in the world. He attacks you now. He attacks you then. He 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 he. I don't know where somebody got off on this tangent that somehow if you live in the world, if you're not saved, the devil somehow loves you and somehow 
gives you everything you want. That's not true. That's a lie. That, that, that's, that's, that's not true. The devil hates you. He despises you. He hated you when you were born. He hates you before you was reborn. He hates you as you born again. He hates he, he hates you. He hates you because of that image that we say we share an image that God gave us. And it's God's fault that we're here in this position to begin with. Because just as soon as Adam fell from 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 the garden, fell from the grace of the Lord, we fell from the position of being the resemblance of God Almighty, when he fell from that reality of the likeness of God, God said, well, you know, I'm devil, you may make him, you know, backslide the garden, but I'm going to let him keep my image just to make you mad, you know, <laughs> and that's what he did. And, and uh, you know, consider Job. Well, how can you say stuff like that, John? Well, think about Job. I mean, who got Job in Job's mess? Mm. It wasn't what? Job. Job mm. didn't go in there. Job didn't go up there and say, I, I sure would like somebody to give me some hell. I need to go some through some hell. You know, Job <laughs> never asked that question. No, you he know? did. Job was a faithful man. Followed the Lord. <clears throat> was sold out to God. So how is it that he goes through all this mess? It's real simple. God, God got him in that mess. God used him. God, God told, go, told the devil, have yes, you sir. considered my servant? My Job? servant. Yep. I mean, I, I mean, can, devil, are you inviting me? I can't get to him. You got this hedge around him. Because God That's knew it. he wasn't going to change. That's exactly right. The focus of that whole thing. Very true. So I hope tonight has been a blessing to you. Those of you who's watching on Facebook, um, this is every we do this every Monday and Tuesday night. Um, let me also enter. I'll, I'll say it again next Monday, but let me also interject it right here. Uh, we've been doing the Book of Acts now for right at two years, and um, we have been throughout the entire thing, and we would cover other parts of Scripture when, as we would chronologically go through it. And just so you know, at this point in time in history, when when the conclusion of this this regalia with Festus and Agrippa in that room, Luke is going to sit down and write the Gospel of Luke at this moment. At this moment, Matthew is going to write his Gospel at this moment. This is what we find in, in history. This is the time that it takes place. Um, and then we're going, we'll see as things progress, you know, what happens after this. Um, I've been praying about it and praying about it. And, uh, and the Lord is leading me into staying chronologically in our study. So as soon as we get done with the book of Acts, which won't be too long from now, we're going to jump over in the book of First Peter. Mm. That will be the very next uh, uh, passage of scripture or, or part of, of the books that get writ next. So we're going to go into that chronological realm. We're going to go jump right in there. So mm. it, this is going to be really, really good. I think you're going to like it. So, but anyway, um, uh, that being said, uh, who, who prayed us in? Michael? I did. Oh, you did? Michael? Get it, man. Get it, man. Get it, get it, get it, man. Well, we we look forward to it. Yes, and don't forget about Saturday night. Yeah, Saturday night. You Saturday. That's a, that's that's the uh, refueling station. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. That's go get a little refueling so you yes. can another week. So let me say so uh, this coming Saturday, I, I'm going to give what I believe is the State of the Union address. What I think, what I believe, what I perceive, what the Lord is showing me how the 2023 is how it's going to come to pass what's going to happen what we should see what we should be looking for the things that's going to take on the things that god has spoken of in his scripture that i see coming to pass and the fulfillment thereof so i'm going to do that on saturday i'm going to really dive into some prophetic things it's just going to be you've never gone you ain't never seen this before i promise you this is going to be something entirely new and different so uh i say you know the, let your friends know. Come join us seven o'clock Eastern time, U.S. time, uh, uh, here on Facebook, on the Word of Truth Family page. It's on my page. It's on the Acts of the Apostles page. It, it's 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 a Saturday Evening Truth page. There's different pages 
that are out there for people who connect. We got something like 28,000 people who connect with us over a course of a week. They don't all come into it at the one night tonight or something like this. Somehow, by the time Friday gets here, it's just exploded. There's just all these people has been to the site. And it's amazing how many people from other countries are tuning in. That just that blows my mind, the figures. So, but but come join us Saturday night, seven o'clock, where we're gonna we're gonna talk about the prophetic word for 2023. That's going to be, that's what we're going to discuss. So invite your friends, tell your friends, come. If you ain't doing nothing Saturday night, man, just hop on there for about an hour. You, you, it's going, you, you'll be glad you did. Just that simple. Yeah, Michael, it's, pray us out, brother. Get your refuel. Get your refuel. <laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, we bow our heads just to say thank you. We thank you for this day, Father. You brought us to this point. We almost there, Father. It's going to be a new day. But Father, you have brought us here, and we thank you for it. Yes. You allowed us to get up this morning, put two feet on the floor, one foot in front of the other. You allowed us to open our eyes and see this day. You allowed us to make it to here, to sit down and get a little bit of knowledge from you. Now, Father, be with two people that's on my mind right now, and that is Frank. Mm. Be with him. Take care of him. Yes. He's in the hospital right now, and he needs help to get up. Mm. Father, I do know, I do know, I do know, I do know, I do know that you are a healer. And Father, be with Miss Pat. Lift her up and turn her around. Yes. Sick today. Yes. And Father, she needs help. Mm hmm and we need help to help as we get on our knees and pray. Some of mm -hmm. us are afraid to get on our knees, but you don't have to kneel down there. Just say the prayer. You just walking, say the prayer. If you if you just cooking, say your prayer. And if you just sitting on the porch, say your prayer. If you going in there in the shower, say your prayer. And and and, and keep it moving. It's like a train. And when the, when, the, when the cabooseman get off the train, they got to go back it up and, and lock it in so they can pull some more of the train. We always got to pull a little bit more each week. Yes. And we thank you for it, Father. So lift us up and turn us around. Let us find out where we're going. Because when we look down, there's nothing there, Father, but concrete. But when we look up, there's nothing but opportunity mm. to call on you, to see where you are. And every time we look a little further out there, there's a twinkle. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of somebody batting their eyes, trying to figure out who that is. Mm. So Father, give us strength right now. Be with us, build a fence around us, keep us healthy in a way that we are spiritually healthy just as well as being foodly healthy. And Father, we thank you right now, Jesus, in your name. Yes. Amen. Amen. All Amen. right. We'll see you Saturday night at 7 o'clock, guys. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. shine upon you and be gracious the Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace somebody say i need his peace today say it with us this time the lord bless you and keep you and keep you that's what his word says make his face shine upon and be gracious be lord because we need you lord lord turn turn your face to
Why don't we seal it like this, everybody? Amen. 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 We stand on your word today, Jesus. Say it again. Amen. 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 So be it, Lord. According to your word. Yeah. 
The way. 